And speaking of prayer, let's start with one. Father, we're grateful for the beautiful day that you've given to us. We love the springtime. We love the summer. We love the hillsides that are green and just verdant with all sorts of flowers. You're an amazing God. And you give so much time and attention and detail to things that sometimes we so easily overlook. But God, we pray that you would help us walk through life with our eyes more wide open so that we can see the things that you have created for us and the beauty. We pray that you would help us to see the things that you've written for us, that we might learn from them and use them and apply them in our lives. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. So this morning's message is like a hand in a glove, and its inspiration was as a result of my work gloves at home that I'll get into in just a moment. You never know where inspiration will come, and it happened to be my work gloves. But this, the, the text is taken from Romans chapter 8, verse 5, and then also verses 9 and 10. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome, those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. There's my work gloves. So I was so proud of these new work gloves that I had just purchased. Now, my old set was worn, had holes in it. It was completely defenseless from the bite that yard work can take out on your hands. So I went to the local hardware store in Ramona, where I live, and shopped until I found just the right pair. I must have examined half a dozen pairs of gloves and probably tried on just as many. After all, you know, what good really are gloves if you don't like them, particularly if they don't fit? And then I found them. With the help of a clerk who did me a favor, she reached under the counter and produced a set that was still in its packaging. Ah, just what I was looking for. Perfect. And at that, I cheerfully paid the purchase price, walked out the door, and drove the short ride home to test out my new gloves. So there I was, standing in my yard with my brand new gloves. I mean, I felt like a kid with a brand new baseball mitt standing out in left field. I plunged my hand into the smooth leather grain cowhide and nothing. My hands seemingly stopped midway into the glove. (laughs) No, if it fits, you must have quit. So his gloves worked. Mine did not, Steve. My hand stopped like midway into the glove. It seems that I couldn't get my fingers into the fingers of the glove. The, the five entryways into the fingers apparently had been stitched closed. Was that a mistake at the factory? Probably. Wasn't an oversight of the store? Maybe, because remember, she pulled it out from underneath the counter. Who knows? But one thing was absolutely certain. My fingers wouldn't fill in the glove. A closed fist could, but an extended hand wouldn't. (sighs) Okay, no problem, I thought. 
I'll just make do with these new gloves as defective as they might be, because who has the time to get back into the car, to go back to the hardware store, to return work gloves that don't work when there's just lots of work at the house to do? So I fisted my way into the palm and parked it right there. My fingers are now folded. The glove fingers are just flopping in the wind. Now, that's not exactly what I had in mind for work gloves. But hey, when it comes to looks and utility, I couldn't complain, right? Because my fingers were now safe. Rose thorns were no longer a problem. Function, however, that was a big problem. Because have you ever tried to pick up a shovel with your fingers folded inside a glove? It's not easy. Neither is mowing the lawn or trimming the roses. Your hands feel like horse's hooves. You just can't get a whole lot done. And forget grabbing some shears or those little plastic whips that you use on the weed whacker. Simply put, I had things to do. I wanted extended fingers stretched and strong because I had a lawn to mow, I had edges to trim, I had weeds to pull. And the same is true for God. He's got things to do as well. Babies, they need hugs. Children need goodnight tucks into bed. AIDS orphans, they need homes. Stressed out executives, they need hope. God has work to do and he needs our hands to do it. What the hand is to the glove, the spirit is to the Christian. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice, I will come into him. Did you hear that? God gets into us, church. At times imperceptibly, and at other times quite disruptively. God gets his fingers into our lives, inch by inch, reclaiming the territory that is rightfully his own. Take your tongue, for example. He claims it so that you can express his message. And your feet, he requisitions them for his purpose. And your mind, he made it and intends to use it and do it for his glory. What about your eyes? What about your face? What about your hands? Through them, God can weep. Through them, God can smile. Through them, God can touch. And as a glove responds to the strength of the hand that fills it, so you will respond to the leading of Christ to the point where, like the Apostle Paul, you can eventually say in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I myself no longer live. It's Christ that lives in me. But the process isn't always immediate. Sometimes it takes a little while. Receiving the unseen is not easy because most Christians, I think, find the cross a lot easier to accept than the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Christ. Good Friday makes a a whole lot more sense than Pentecost when they receive the Holy Spirit. Christ, our substitute, Jesus taking our place, the Savior paying for our sins, those are absolutely astounding, yet understandable concepts, at least in our head. They fall into the area of what's called transaction and substitution. And it's familiar territory, I think, for a lot of us. I mean, we just went through Easter, right? But Holy Spirit discussions, 
they kind of lead us into the realm of the supernatural and the unseen, subjects about which most of us quickly grow quiet or cautious because we fear what we can't see or explain. So I wanted to try and help you think about God's Spirit from maybe a slightly different angle. Think about what Jesus did in Galilee. When Jesus lived and worked in Galilee, he did that with Galileans, right? Jesus lived with them. He uh, tabernacled with them, as it says. He put up his tent there. I mean, that's where Jesus was. And he was doing things in Galilee for the Galileans. And he was doing things similar to what the Holy Spirit does for us. Jesus lived among the people. He taught them. He comforted them. And he convicted some of them. And the Holy Spirit lives within us. It teaches us. It comforts us. And at times, it convicts us too. The New Testament word for this promise is oikio, which means to live or to dwell. And oikio comes from a Greek noun oikos, which means house. In other words, the Holy Spirit indwells the believer the same way a homeowner indwells a house. You live in it, right? The same way the Holy Spirit lives in each of us. In fact, the word goes on to talk about in Romans chapter 8, again, verse 5 and 9 and 10, kind of the text. Let me just repeat that for you. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them. It's living and breathing God. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed the invisible but clearly present God, or the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. And the reason why I wanted to go over that scripture again is because I wanted to make sure that you caught some of the phrases of permanency in the passage. God's Spirit is in them. God himself has taken up residence in your life, and you are the person in whom he dwells. To Timothy, Paul urged in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, you have been trusted with a wonderful treasure. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. And later on, could the apostle's words have been any clearer when he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? you. All believers have God in their heart, but not all believers have given their whole heart to God. Remember, the question is really not so much, how can I have more of the Holy Spirit, but rather, how can the Holy Spirit have more of me? A palm and a few fingers just won't do. So, take an inventory. As you look around your life, do you see any resistant pockets like my work gloves? Any stitched up fingers? I mean, go down the list. Your tongue, for example. Do you stretch the truth? Do you puff up the facts? How about your language? Is your speech a sewer of profanities and foul talk? Or how about grudges? Do you harbor resentment 
like boats at a dock? And while we're at it, are you unproductive and lazy? Do you live off the system, assuming that the church or the country should take care of you? And I'm sorry if these questions seem a little offensive, but those aren't my words. Those are Paul's. He wrote the checklist, and here's what he said. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 31. So put away all falsehood and tell your neighbor the truth because we belong to each other. And don't sin by letting anger gain control over you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. For anger gives a mighty foothold to the devil. If you're a thief... Stop stealing. Begin using your hands for honest work and then give generously to others that are in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything that you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live Remember, he is the one who has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all other types of malicious behavior. So the question is, do your actions interrupt the flow of the Holy Spirit in your life? Harbored sin interferes with the spirit circulation within our bodies. Confessed sin, however, repairs the heart and it restores that power. But it could take time, so don't give up. Don't let stumbles stop you. Come and then keep coming. Ask and keep asking. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus says, your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and continue to ask him. It reminds me a little bit of a fly you know, a fly that I encountered some time ago in an airplane. So on this flight, there was a fly that was buzzing around the cabin. And I thought, well, that's odd. A fly flying inside a flying plane. Why would a fly fly during a flight? Now, these are the things that go through my mind. I don't know that you would want to live in my mind, but this is sometimes where it goes. Why would a fly fly during a flight? I mean, does he think that maybe he's helping the plane somehow? Doing his part to keep the aircraft aloft? Why did the fly in the plane fly in the plane. Why didn't the fly just light for a moment, right? And just enjoy the flight. Maybe he thought the airplane needed him. And just like that, he flew to the front of the plane. Moments later, however, he returned. This time looking far less confident than he was before. Fear flickered in his tiny red bug eyes. And that's when he spoke to me. I don't think I can keep it up, he said. Keep what up, I said. The plane. I don't think I can keep the plane up. I'm flying as furiously as I can. But my wings are getting tired. I don't know how long I can do this. And I said, but don't you know that it's not up to you? Look, you're surrounded by strength 
and power? I mean, we're airborne by a power that isn't your power. So stop flying. It's not up to you to get this plane home. Insulted, he buzzed off. Now granted, I don't make a habit of speaking to flies. <laughs> Although I have had a few choice words for a few of them in Ramona during the summertime. But we all, all of us, fly furiously back and forth, don't we? We're always busy, always thinking that the success of the journey is going to be up to us. And we fear letting up, don't we? Well, my encouragement to you is stop. Stop for a moment and look out the window of your life. God's wings sustain you. His power empowers you. You can flap like a fly if you want to, but you're not going to accelerate your flight. It's your job to rest and to receive. You need to accept God's power in your life. That is the Holy Spirit. You be the glove, and you let him get his hands deep down inside each one of those fingers of your life. You need to surrender to his plan and then keep at it. Unceasingly seek God's spirit. You need to accept and surrender and keep at it. A-S-K. Or you need to ask, seek, and not. A-S-K. Your heavenly Father, to those who ask him, Luke chapter 11, verse 13. So this week, let God put his spirit deep, deep, deep into the fingers of your life. Then you'll truly be able to experience the hand-in-glove relationship that Christ died for. It's hard not to want to be in control. But God has given each of us a gift, and that is the Holy Spirit, to indwell us for a number of reasons. First of all, the giving of the Holy Spirit was to let his children know that they have been redeemed and have been taken over as the possession of Jesus Christ for a long time, eternal relationship with him forever. Kind of like a marking, a tattoo. But the Holy Spirit is also given to us for other reasons. Now, all of us are differently equipped. Some have the ability to work in certain capacities. Some have the ability to love in different capacities, to come alongside someone and provide comfort. Everybody is wired different, and everybody has their own gifts. And it's the Holy Spirit that helps us to identify what those gifts are and then gives us the ability to use those gifts in certain periods of time. Also, the Holy Spirit also prompts us. Have you ever had a situation where you've been reading your Bible and you've probably read a verse a hundred times and on that hundred and first time it just jumps off the page? What changed? It's always been there. You've read it a hundred times before. Why on that hundred and first time did it seem to come alive for you? Sometimes that's life's experiences that make it more relevant, perhaps. But it's also the prompting of the Holy Spirit that enlightens us to demonstrate to us that God's Word is sharp and it's active and it's always alive. 
And I think the Holy Spirit also will, from time to time, prompt us. Have you ever been in a situation in which you've prayed, God, I need to talk to somebody, and I just don't know how to bring up the subject. Maybe they're grieving. Maybe they've wronged you. Maybe you need to have some clarity on a situation, and you're fearful because you don't know how they're going to take what you need to say. Have you ever stopped before you said anything and said, just God, give me the right words? And perhaps, more often than not, the conversation goes extraordinarily better than you could have ever anticipated. Maybe you find out new information. Maybe some of the assumptions that you made in connection with that person were wrong, and so they've corrected you to let you know that, no, that's not quite the way the facts are. And we learn from that, and we gain from that, and that's how the Holy Spirit works in our life. But if we come to God with our fingers stitched up that only allow so much of God to get into our life, it's ineffective, and the fingers are just flopping in the breeze, and it's not serving the purpose for which it was intended. But if we consciously allow God to get his fingers into our life, through his Holy Spirit, then we can be effective and do that for which he's designed us to be. So this week, you can remember the fly story. You can remember the glove story. You can remember any of those stories. But let it be the hook upon which you remember the Holy Spirit to ask, to seek, to knock, do so repetitively, to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Now, the song that we're going to sing is, I Know Whom I Have Believed. You all do. You're here for a reason. You believe in Jesus Christ as being God's Son, who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for each of us so that one day we might live with him forever. But let this song continue to be an encouragement to you about what you believe and, the, I guess, the quality of your conviction. So Steve is going to be leading us in that song. If you have any prayer requests, you can hand them up as we sing. At the close of the song, we'll talk about those prayer requests, and I have a couple, and then we will be dismissed. So if you would, let's stand and let's sing, please. So as I said, I have a couple prayer requests that were provided to me. One is from Miss D. I'm so thankful you printed out in large print that I don't even need my glasses. Vanity. <laughs> yeah. And this made me laugh when I first read it, and it'll probably make you laugh too. So last Sunday, I asked Randy why we sometimes choose prayer last. And Randy replied, well, it's our nature. One of the names for Jesus is the Good Shepherd, and the shepherd's job is to take care of sheep. And in one of Randy's older messages, he told us just how helpless sheep are. But after he described some things that they do or don't, I thought to myself, I don't know if sheep are helpless or just stupid. These are Dee's words. Well, Christians in the Bible are sometimes referred to as sheep. So I guess the reason we pray as a last resort is because we've realized we're helpless. I know there have been times when I try to handle things myself. Then when I've failed, I pray. So I guess that makes me stupid. <laughs> Very good, Miss D. You put a smile on my face. Put a smile on my face. That's why it's so good to get together as a family, because we get to laugh and sing and pray and study God's word. I'm blessed. I have some bad news, though. Um, Connie Weatherford, she's been a longtime member here. Her health and work circumstances sometimes prevent her from coming. But she has a brother, Danny Thomas. And Danny Thomas had some surgery that they thought was going to fix a problem. And apparently, it didn't work because he passed away. Now, the message that Connie left, we don't know if it was yesterday or today, but it's been obviously very recent. Danny Thomas, to help you make a further connection, is if you remember Leona Thomas, she had two children, Danny 
and Connie. So this is Leona Thomas's son, Danny Thomas. So if you would, maybe pick up the phone, call Connie, let her know that you're thinking about her. We'll certainly put it in the bulletin. I'll put it out in a blast so that everybody will be mindful of that. But Connie is hurting because she's lost her mom and she's lost her brother. So if you would keep Connie and their extended family in your prayers. Anything else, church? Gabe, don't be a stranger. Now, I realize sometimes your work schedule prevents you from being here. And if you want good Mexican food, we'll give a shout out to La Cocina, where Gabe is a chef. Pretty good Mexican food over there at La Cocina. Wow. So he brings his chefness to home, too? Amazing. Good for you. You take care of your mom. She loves you a lot. We've been praying for you. And I know that things have been really topsy-turvy in your life, the divorce and then kind of the hatefulness associated with your ex taking your daughter to Tennessee. But all those things have been resolved in your favor, and we've been praying for you, Gabe. And so it's good to have you. If not, let's pause for a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for the day that you've given to us today. Thank you for an opportunity to come to you in prayer. Help it not just to be the only time today. And sometimes, Father, prayer doesn't have to be so many words as it is just thank you or help me or give me the right words to say. It doesn't have to be lengthy. Sometimes just a brief shout out is good to just let us know and let you know that you are on our minds and we're thinking of you because you're our Father. And like a father, Gabe needs some help. He's in a situation now that he thought had been resolved, and now there's one more potential stumbling block that's been put in his way. And so, Father, we ask that you would work in those circumstances, work with the court, work with the judge, work to demonstrate that the ex was also in ROTC and using those same devices and that they're not weapons of mass destruction, but are dummies that are there for a reason to help provide the kind of service that the ROTC provides in honoring our troops and honoring our country. So God, be in it. We pray that you would give Gabe the result that he seeks. And now collectively our hearts hurt for our sister Connie, who's lost her brother. Father, we pray that you would be with the Thomas household as they grieve a husband's passing, a father's passing, and in Connie's case, a brother's passing. We pray, Father, that you would just comfort them, come alongside them, know that they are loved, and that we will do what we can to come alongside them and help them as best we can. So, Father, be with them, comfort and guide them, and bless them, even during these difficult times. And so, Father, we're thankful that you loved us like you do, that while we were yet sinners, you sent your Son, Jesus, to die for us, and that, yes, we are all like sheep, We've gone our own way. We've gone astray. And sometimes we don't make the smartest choices. And yet, like the Good Shepherd, you continue to corral us. You continue to bring us into safe pastures. You lead us beside still streams and still waters. You give us comfort and you restore our soul. And even though we can walk through some pretty scary places, Father, we know that you are with us and that you continue to guide us. So today, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us even more tomorrow and the next day and the next day and help us to continue to ask and to seek and to knock, wanting that infilling of the Holy Spirit so that we can be the child that you want us to be and more importantly, that we can be the hands in this world to serve others who are hurting and are in need. So watch over us and guide us. Be with us this day. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a great Sunday and a great week.